Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, a key lawmaker talks about residency requirements for candidates, and the co-chair of the Reproductive Freedom Caucus describes the group's goals. Plus, a divide emerges over how to allocate $250 million for frontline workers. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. The controversy over where Representative John Thompson resides in combination with the process of redrawing legislative districts statewide prompted the Senate, State Government and Elections Committee to hold an informational hearing last week. Joining me in the studio is the chair of that committee, Senator Mary Kiffmeyer. Welcome. Glad to be with you. The informational hearing last week covered both residency law and the candidate filing process. The last update to election law, the big one, was in 2010, and integrity, both in the election process and among candidates, is frequently talked about. Is it time to revisit some areas of election law, in particular in these areas? I think in the area of affidavit of a candidacy, residency really matters. Residency matters when you vote. You have to be a resident of the precinct to get a ballot in that precinct. So also in a district, a legislator uh, should be able to prove that they're a resident of that particular legislative district. The voters should know that and the system should uh, implement that. And so I think right now we've seen that that checkoff box where you show no proof of the police report, no proof of an order of protection, they just check it and it's really pretty loose. And with redistricting next year, which is a year anyway where residency laws are a big deal, and proving that you live there uh, can become a court case and almost always is. This is the time to pay attention to it and maybe tighten things up a bit so that we don't, we avoid the court if at all possible. Right, so in 2010, part of the law change required that the candidate list an address, um, unless, as you mentioned, there's an order of protection or a police report that mm -hmm. that means that the person does not want their address known because basically we've been operating on a kind of honor honor system and each candidate just checks a box that you know an affidavit i verify that this is true so do we need a system to verify and is that even possible i mean there are a lot of elected officials across the state well that's why i held the hearing was to say what what feasibility what area what should we do but fundamentally the candidate is responsible for their residence and proving it. The problem is there's no verification of that right now because of the checkbox. So either we need to make it meaningful, they attach a protection order or a, um, a police report to their filing, and then the Secretary of State has to verify that the actual address. But to tell the truth, you're a public elected official. <laughs> you are public, and anybody can um, figure out where you live, especially in this day and age. Uh, so I don't know if it's outlived its usefulness. The other thing is we changed the election law this year that any candidate can take uh, $3,000 over a two year period and use it for security such as ring or whatever system you wanna choose to help uh, ensure the uh, protection of your home. That's really important. I think when we've done that, then I think the actual validity of this has probably outlived its usefulness. And I think that's a really important consideration to the voters. This is about the voters and making sure that they're electing someone who actually lives in their district. They deserve to know that. It, it occurred to me that some of this could just be a side effect of a growing population. I grew up in a small town and frankly, we knew where everybody lived, right? But in big cities, big urban areas, Unfortunately, you know, we often don't even know our neighbors, let alone where our elected officials live. But could this process of verification, I mean, how do we make sure that it's verifying but not unduly intrusive for a candidate who, you know, candidates are not yet elected. They are just simply candidates. Yeah, and because they put down an address, even with a protection order or some or police report, even if they put that down and that address is in the precinct, the question is, do they actually live there? That's the hearing that I had, which is on the residency law. What does it take to say this is your residence? Again, legendary court cases. Uh, candidates taken off the ballot 
because of that through a court action. That is really where some of those things should happen. But the bigger thing is at the inception, when you fill out your affidavit of candidacy, my belief is every candidate should fully and transparently and honestly put down their residence, where they live, and fulfillment and requirements of the Minnesota state law. And I think that is in the best interest of voters and that at least simplifies things, makes that part of it up front. Now there still can be questions in regards to do you actually live there, which is why two candidates in the past were taken off the ballot because there was a lot of investigation by the opposition party and questioned it, took it to the court and they were taken off the ballot. So first of all, candidate be honest and transparent fulfill the requirement, you are a resident. And the other thing is um, showing proof maybe through a copy of their driver's license, which if that were given with their filing, that might help to enhance that sort of thing. But we'll be holding a hearing uh, next February, but because it's a short session and we have redistricting right away, I felt candidates really needed to know up front um, the situation of residency. One other thing I wanted to touch on, it's sort of the other side of the coin because politics are very polarized right now and conceivably there is greater danger for both candidates and elected officials. One of the changes in, 2020, er, in 2010 was that requirement to publish candidates' addresses. But where is the line between privacy and public data? Now you mentioned technology, we can figure out where people live, but, but there, is there a security concern? Well, that's why we did the money, which enabled them to take out other campaign funds instead of personal funds, campaign funds that they can use for that purpose under guidelines and other things, and a lot of it at their discretion for what they do with that. And I think that has already addressed what you can reasonably do, reminding ourselves they're a public official nonetheless. So if you step up and say, I want to be a public official, Part of that is residency and where you live, such that all the voters in your district can know that transparently. You've been a lawmaker for more than a dec decade, and this will be the second time that you go through the redistricting process. Um, I looked on a map, and it looks to me like you're pretty squarely within your district, so I can't imagine that it causes you any stress or late-night worry about it changing. But I have a story for that. You have a story for that. <laughs> but, but you talk to your colleagues, and, and mm -hmm. this, I think, can be a stressful time. How do lawmakers feel about the idea that, you know, the people they have been representing may not be their people anymore or they you know it, it, it's shifting and, mm -hmm. and can you talk a little bit about that? That is very hard on people this whole thing of every 10 years what I just got used to them I just figured out <laughs> who they are figured out how to contact them and now you're changing that well it's the Constitution every 10 years we count so you get fair representation that lines change and matter of fact sometimes remember who you vote for changes anyway. They aren't permanent, so they're going to resign or leave for other reasons. But redistricting is a fairly substantial um, shakeup. That is really, really hard for people. And I think that the issue of residency and being transparent, that's going to really help people, but also getting the information out right away. Uh, but generally that does pretty well, but people then tend to th not think about it till they go vote. <laughs> and then they do that. It's just the nature of that. And it is a challenging and difficult time. My sympathy to everybody. But it is really important. So in my district, my district right now, because of the increase in population, my geography is going to get smaller. That means I'm going to lose some people that have been used to me representing them. That's hard for me. I like them. I enjoy them. But it's going to be change, and they're going to have change because of that as well. Now, in the northwest corner, southeast, southwest, the corners of Minnesota, which are buffered by North Dakota and Canada, et cetera, they're going to increase probably in geography. And so that's going to be change there. Pretty much any district in the state of Minnesota is going to see change. It's just the nature of things every 10 years. And my sympathy to you, the big thing is grab hold of it, understand it's coming, understand it's really in your best interest as voters so that you have as close as possible equal representation. So I used to have um, a, a certain number of voters. Uh, now geography changes, just the nature of redistricting. It's for your good for Minnesota, sorry. Change is coming, as you said. Senator Mary Kiffmeyer, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah. Good to be with you.
Republican and DFL members of the Frontline Worker Pay Working Group remain divided over how to divvy up the $250 million set aside by the legislature to reward workers who continued to work in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have decided um, a meaningful amount for, for this group of workers. Again, um, the sectors of, of nursing homes, long-term care, nurses, healthcare aides, first responders, corrections officers, and hospice workers uh, that didn't have the option to work remotely. That Again, there was a few things that we agreed upon in committee, and one of them was they did not have the option to work remotely. Uh, so, but we really honed in on this sector, and we feel that a meaningful amount for these folks would be $1,200. Uh, this bonus shows our gratitude to these critical care workers who put themselves most at risk to keep the rest of us safe and healthy. This $1,200 would be a big thank you. You hear these stories, you quickly recognize that there are those who went above and beyond the call of duty. Um, they had sustained extremely high risk that set them as a group in a very, very special recognition that is needed for them, but not just because of what they have done, but what we need them to do. We still need them to do this. And so being able to give them this meaningful uh, money would be very helpful in helping to retain long-term care, to retain our nurses, to retain our first responders, the Department of Corrections, the hospice workers, respiratory therapists, and those. You clearly see after all of this testimony that this is a very special group of people. The Democrats initially made their proposal. They suggested $1,500 per person. Uh, but when you did the math on that, and, the, and then the, the, the suggestion with that then was that it would be an application process, and then however many people applied, um, it would actually be distributed evenly among the number of applicants. The problem is, with that is that they, they were going to publicly say that they were giving people $1,500. But when you divided that out by their eligible pool of workers, we were looking at about $200. That's a bait and switch. We cannot do that to Minnesotans. We have to make decisions. And the decision here is obvious. The decision here is obvious. There is a group of workers, those who worked in long-term care, in hospitals, those nurses, those first responders. These folks were assuming risk that other people just were not assuming. Let us not forget that many of the frontline workers our GOP colleagues want to exclude from recognition of hero pay dealt with some of the highest COVID outbreaks in their workplaces, which means they contracted the virus and likely spread it to their families. Some are dealing with long-term effects of the virus, and sadly, some of those workers lost their lives. To all of the frontline workers that had to hear that they are not worthy, of recognition from this $250 million. We want you to know that you are worthy. Frontline workers request funds. We estimate each worker will receive a minimum of $375 per worker from the $250 million appropriation as it currently stands. Now, this amount is not sufficient to reflect workers' sacrifices, but it is meaningful. For example, $375 would cover about two weeks of groceries for a family of three. We believe more resources should be allocated either during the special legislative session or the next regular legislative session to increase the distribution amounts to these workers. We went into a peacetime emergency in the state of Minnesota and across this country because we didn't fully understand the risks of the virus, but we knew that it was deadly. Most Minnesotans were sent home from work, but a group of Minnesota workers were told they had to go to work. They were essential. They were essential to keep our hospitals functioning, our nursing home functioning, our grocery stores functioning, supply lines functioning, so people could stay home and live. Those essential workers are still working on the front lines of this global pandemic, and they have all borne risk, regardless of where they worked. And they are all now worthy of frontline worker pay. And it is, I will say for me, quite offensive that some of my colleagues would propose to exclude the very, very difficult work that essential workers did across the state to keep people healthy, to keep people alive, and to keep our economy moving. I think that the powerful stories we have heard from workers all through the working group 
sessions that we've had, the stories we've heard today and will continue to hear are what this is about. It is about recognizing people who have done amazing things for us, who have sacrificed tremendously for us. It is about taking care of workers. It is also about protecting us and having stronger communities in every part of the state. Every Minnesotan is going to be better off if more healthcare workers, if more people who are cleaning our buildings, more people who are serving our food, more people who are providing essential services to us get recognition for the job that they have done and are encouraged to stay working. The Supreme Court is poised to hear arguments in a case that challenges Roe v. Wade, the landmark 1973 decision that guarantees a woman's right to end a pregnancy. Many states have recently passed laws to limit access to abortion care, most notably Texas. In response, DFL members of the Minnesota House and Senate announced the formation of a Reproductive Freedom Caucus. This week, I spoke with Senator Jennifer McEwen, vice chair of the new caucus, about the group's goals. At the press conference where you and your colleagues announced the creation of this caucus, you said, quote, we can no longer be playing defense. We can no longer be put on our heels in responding to the attacks on reproductive justice and reproductive freedom. That statement implies that you feel that abortion rights are in peril, are they? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. It's a real pleasure and honor to, to join you um, to talk about this today. We really appreciate it. Um, and I think the obvious answer is yes. Um, um, comprehensive reproductive rights are in peril now, and they have been under attack for years. So, um, you know, the the court decisions that we're seeing come down are just sort of the latest iteration of the attacks on reproductive health care um, for um, people. And um, the this latest push has been extra alarming, I think, for people because it sort of um, hits um, across socioeconomic spectrums when we're talking about our basic right to receive healthcare services. So we're very fortunate here in Minnesota because of our court precedents. We have under our state law, um, under our court decisions here in Minnesota, a right to uh, access to comprehensive reproductive care, including abortion, uh, under Minnesota law. Um, but we're sort of unique in that aspect. So as we're seeing these attacks come nationwide at the federal level, we know and anticipate that they're going to be happening in various states. And it's very important that we really hold the line here in Minnesota. Now, that said, the Supreme Court will be taking up a case that could has the potential to overturn Roe v. Wade. If that were to happen, what you're saying, though, is, is that right is still secure in Minnesota? That's correct. That's correct. Under um, court precedent, under the Minnesota Supreme Court, they have um, held that our state constitution provides um, the right to access uh, comprehensive uh, reproductive care, including abortion, um, as a right of privacy. So people who are able to um, bear children um, and carry, carry children, to, uh, carry a pregnancy and bear children um, have that right um, to be able to make those decisions for themselves under Minnesota law. Um, but we do have efforts in the legislature to really fortify those, uh, the, the rights that are under the case law as well. So we need to see that in our statutory framework in addition to the case law piece. So also at this press conference, uh, Representative Jamie Becker Finn, who is also a member, uh, gave a memorable quote. She said, this is not your grandmother's choice caucus. Uh, several of the caucus members pointed out that this caucus is about more than just access to abortion. What else is it about? Well, I keep saying the word comprehensive reproductive care. And that really is what this is about. Oftentimes this the care has been boiled down to this, to the abortion question and whether how fe people feel about abortion itself, the procedure at different points in pregnancy, and we try to break that down. But what we've seen really over um, the recent decades is a real attack on access to reproductive care itself. We especially see those disparities with 
um, people of color not having the same kind of access to care and also not receiving the same kind quality level of care in regard to their pregnancies, in regard to getting information that they need to make decisions about their health care. So when we talk about reproductive care, yes, access to abortion is a fundamental right. It is a part of health care and it needs to be protected. Um, but what we are talking about with this caucus is a much more comprehensive view um, that really brings in that larger access piece, the larger equity piece, and really addresses those disparities and that chipping away at people's rights and access that we've seen over decades. To dig a little deeper, deeper into the maternal health care piece, Representative Athena Hollis spoke of the failure to provide adequate reproductive care to women who are black, indigenous, and people of color. In fact, according to Fox 9, black women are more than twice as likely to die during pregnancy than white women, and indigenous women are more than four times as likely to die as their white counterparts. What can the legislature do to address these disparities? Um, yeah, this is exactly what we're talking about. Um, and um, those numbers are just absolutely unacceptable. So there are a number of things that the leg legislature can and should be doing. Um, they range from small changes within our current health system to gear it toward greater access for reproductive care, um, to make sure that we have universal coverage within the current um, framework that we have. And ultimately, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, what I would like to see is the Minnesota Health Plan passed so that we truly do have um, profit taken out of our healthcare system and true access to comprehensive health care uh, for everybody. Um, but there are other pieces too, like sex education, comprehensive sex education. So Minnesotans really understand um, and have the information that they need to make the decisions that are best for their lives um, and really have agency and choice. And so, um, and there are other pieces too. You know, one of the things we've talked about as a caucus is this isn't only in the realm of reproductive health and health legislation. There are other things that we can do as a legislature to improve equity across the board. And I'm talking about economic equity. So things like having um, paid family leave, those things provide agency to people in making, in being able to make decisions for their own health, being able to act in their own best interests, not being strapped down economically um, in, in situations that make it difficult for them to access care, difficult for them to find time to take care of themselves, to, to get to the doctor and to get quality care. So all of those pieces, those equity pieces that are broad ranging and they span sort of the issue spectrum really, that's what we're hoping to be able to work on. And I think that we can find some um, across the aisle and um, nonpartisan, but really um, across that spectrum as well, some common ground. Well, and speaking of that common ground, that goes to my next question. I did a keyword search, uh, bill search in the Senate, the word abortion. Um, it generated 12 bills, some to further restrict abortion, others to um, protect reproductive options and remove barriers. But there was one successful bipartisan um, piece that was passed last session that had to do with um, maternal health care, and that was the Healthy Start Act, which allows incarcerated pregnant women to stay with their newborn babies for up to a year. So what maybe are some other ideas where common ground can be reached? Well, I think you know, that's a, an excellent example. And in my work, I worked as a public defender for um, some years before I uh, ran for office. And some of the most gut-wrenching experiences that I had as an attorney were having clients who were separated from their babies or who were pregnant entering incarceration and knew that they would lose their child. It was just unconscionable. So uh, it was so good to see that um, coming together around that legislation and really applaud the hard work that went into making that happen. I do think that there are other pieces and we're going to be looking for those pieces and open to hearing various ideas and really that equity piece of, of what is going to be good for people, what is going to um, allow people to have agency in their lives to be able to make decisions about 
raising their children empowered to, to do that in a healthy way. And um, I think that there will be common ground. We're going to find common pieces and we'll pursue those as they come and arrive. One final question for you. Um, according to ongoing Gallup polling, nearly half of Americans believe that abortion should be legal with some restrictions. Uh, one in three, so a third, believe it should be legal with no restrictions. It's only one in five, or 19 percent, who believe it should be completely illegal. So polling is showing that a majority of Americans are in favor of access to abortion care. Why is this issue, in your view, coming so far to the forefront? Yeah, it, that's a great question. It, and we know as a caucus that partly why we formed this caucus is really spurred on by that realization like, wait a minute, Minnesotans are with us on this. We want to advocate and fight for Minnesotans' right to reproductive health care. So why are we finding ourselves in this moment um, where our basic human rights are, have, are truly coming under attack now at the federal level? And um, sort of enough is enough uh, with this. And we need to come together to protect Minnesotans' reproductive rights. You know, and, and I think it, it really is, you know, it's, it's complicated. I think there are a number of factors that have led us to the place that we're in right now. Um, but there's, there's polarization politically, um, certainly. And this has also been used as, as a wedge issue for advantage by some politicians um, to really sort of um, gain advantage with parts of the electorate to sort of rev up um, anger and fear. Um, and, and in doing so, it's, been, it's led us down a pretty destructive path. So I think that us coming together in this caucus really represents a a vision, as my colleague said, this isn't your grandmother's uh, reproductive caucus. And it is, I think that we have um, amongst us, there's a lot of new membership in this caucus of new people that have come into the legislature. And we're ready to really forge, move forward with a new approach to reproductive health. It, with a comprehensive view and an inclusive view and that lens of, of equity that we're seeing this through. So, and that really is the, the approach I think that most people understand this type of care as it happens in their lives. So really bringing it out of that polarization and the sort of buzzwords that have gone along with that divide over the last decades and really getting real about where reproductive health care is for Minnesota. Senator Jennifer, Jennifer McEwen, I want to thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.